Welcome. Good morning, everybody. So thank you for being here. So let's uh, let's start. So we're continuing with Rabbi Shtaif. We're going to learn some chapters of Rabbi Shtaif that are so relevant for us to understand the importance of making sure that we don't fall under the influence of idol worshippers. That how far do we have to go not to fall under the influence of idol worshippers? So let's take a look over here. We're going to pull up the uh, Rabbi Shtaif pages. Here on page Shin Mem Vav, page 346. There we go. Okay. At the bottom. And it, it says over here, Simen Chof Zayin, chapter 27. Shalodi Chos Brisla Evdi Kach Ovedi Zara, Shahim Zayna Amim Niskarim Batera. That we're not allowed to enter into a covenant with idolaters, that they are the seven nations that are mentioned in the Torah. This is the Chinuch. The uh, Chinuch list, this is commandment number 93. And remember, the Chinuch is taking the mitzvahs, the 615 commandments, as articulated, identified by the Rambam, Maimonides, and he's listing them in order uh, how they appear in the Torah. So this is the 93rd, according to that counting, it's the 93rd commandment, divine loving guidance, as it appears in the Torah, and it appears in the book of Exodus. And we're going to pull up over here, like it says in chapter, uh, paragraph 1 here, Aleph Shenemar, look at Shmeis Chof Gimel, Lama Beis. We're looking now at Exodus 23, 32, and we should see over here, Chapter 23. Chapter 23 discusses a number of different commandments. It's in the Parshish Mishpatim. And about verse 27, it starts to discuss God Almighty's insurances that he is going to help the children of Israel to enter and conquer the Holy Land. This is in verse 27. And you could take a look here, uh, and God Almighty says that I'm going to send my fear before you. People are going to flee. And all the people that you're coming to are going to be confused. God Almighty's fear is going to go before the children of Israel. He's going to send a certain insect that will harass and drive out these three of the nations are mentioned here and god almighty says in verse 29 i'm not going to dispel these people in one year lest the earth should become vacant desolate and they'll become just wild beasts and they'll become very wild remember these human beings have already conquered it from in in the context these the Canaanites already conquered it from the times earlier times so over the previous 2,500 years, almost 2,600 years, and they had, as it says, we have to conquer the earth. Humanity has that obligation, God Almighty says. This has already been done. We're not going to allow it to go to desolation. Now, as a parenthetical observation over here that we need to pay attention to, is that we can see that we are not allowed to let the earth revert to its unimproved state. So, here we have a, the, the whole focus, focal point of coming out of the, whole, of the land of Egypt, of the bondage of the land of Egypt, and receiving the Torah of Mount Sinai. The Jewish people are meant to, uh, to go into the Holy Land, conquer the Holy Land. And we've seen... That the reason that these people were 
who were there prior to that were being driven out was because of their behaviors. So you would think this is the this is the most important thing. We, we're learning here, studying the laws against idolatry. We're not allowed to uh, allow, to practice idolatry. We're not allowed to allow idolaters to practice idolatry. So it would seem that the most important thing is get these people out of the Holy Land. In fact, they're being expelled for the fact of their idolatry. Yet God Almighty says, I'm not going to send them all at one time because let's say you have the advancing children of Israel. Um, if if the people flee too fast, there's going to be this, this vacancy, the desolateness, and the world is the, 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 it's going to return to these wild beasts. So what's so bad about that? We need to say if the people of the Canaanite nations are so terrible, which we see that they are, that's why they're being expelled. Uh, not that they're terrible in that their essence, they're terrible in their behavior. So why wouldn't that be a higher priority to get them out? Why is it such a priority not to... To, to, to let them linger, so to speak, until the children of Israel have the ability to occupy the land properly to continue its use right, by humanity, by human beings, and not allow this vacuum to occur, which would cause even a temporary reversion to the desolateness and to the wild beasts. So we see that the, the, how important it is to God Almighty that the conquering of the land by humanity, by men to come and rule over the earth, to bring about it to an improved state. The ultimate fulfillment of this, we see that in the prophecies of the coming Mashiach, that the wild animals, the wild beasts are going to be, have tame natures. In God Almighty's eyes, there is not a benefit to nature as a the, the natural world and natural spaces as a wild space un being desolate of human beings and the just wild beasts filling it so we have to really understand this it's a very very essential concept because the idolatry of the worship of Mother Earth has the exact opposite belief. The idolatry of the worship of Mother Earth, which is represented and, and is carried out in varying degrees of honesty by environmentalist groups and theories and viewpoints and so forth, is that the Earth, untouched by humanity, is in its best state. The natural state, the unimpacted by humanity, is the ideal and um so therefore the fewer people the better god forbid and this is taken to the point of obviously trying to reduce the number of people born eliminate people that are already born through war and famine and so forth and in addition to that there is a movement afoot to create re uh, wild spaces, like, you know, let spaces go back to the wild. So there's a place in New Jersey called Duke Farms. The Duke family was um, a wealthy family, owned many, many acres, and they created this beautiful, beautiful gardens. You know, really bringing out the beauty. And they created bridges and paths and observation points and, and lakes and so on and so forth. So my wife heard about this and she said, well, they have biking there. It's a great place to go biking. So we went there as a family. What I noticed is that under the modern leadership of the foundation or the group that has been the successor to the family, they're taking a policy of reverting it back to its wild state. So the paths, uh, the, 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 Instead of having these big open grassy areas, they're being allowed to regrow with whatever grows there. And you could see the wildness 
re-encroaching and starting to take over large parts of the state. And what I saw when I was there, and I expressed this to my family, I see you're walking along and you you see a tree, you see a leaf, you see a green thing, and you don't necessarily understand the difference between what the intention is of the people who are involved with this. But when you see the intention of it, that their intention is really to, to bring this property back to a place that there's no human beings. God forbid. They're allowing human beings to observe the increasing wildness, so to speak. Like we're, we're, we're observers of the, dec oh, the, God forbid, the decimation of humanity. We get, we're watching in slow motion. It's not so uh, intimidating. It's not so, uh, um, because it's slow motion. And it looks, it's, we, they trick us into saying, oh, this is so beautiful. Look, it's back to the wild. Why cut the grass? Why not just let it be wild and so forth? And the answer is that we see over here from the Torah is telling us, no, we don't, we want to improve prove the land the land is meant to be man is meant to be the master of the land because this is god almighty's vision because god almighty recognizes that the divine presence dwells on the man divine the divine presence does not dwell on trees so there's a cosmic battle going on over here the worshiper of mother earth and as I said before, there's varying degrees. Some are telling you, you know, to save the save the, this animal and save this animal. They present it in very sympathetic ways, and it's very um, seems very appealing. It seems very innocuous. Why why not save this animal? Save this animal. It sounds good, but it's all part of a movement. That's how they appeal to people to join the agenda and fund the agenda. But the, it's much more radical than that. The, the, it's to the point that we're going to see what's the radicalness. The radicalization is that scrap all the ideas that the highest form of creation is man, that there's a God almighty that values the human being over all other, other creations, gives creation into the hands of man to steward, and seek the elimination as part of the war on God almighty, seek the elimination of he who bears the divine image and he who provides the, the dwelling spot the dwelling space for the for the divine presence. So it makes a difference. You have to you if your field has been taken and made into a place that's going to provide abundance for human beings, you should not allow it to revert to the wild. But yeah, we see that governments are paying farmers not to farm their land. Now, the first the tendency is well. Okay, they're gonna you're gonna mow it every year, to at least keep it from turning wild. But the that's cost money unless someone's taking it for hay. And is doing it for free. He's basically taking the hay, and that's his compens. That's that's you're getting the benefit of having it hayed, and he's getting the benefit of the hay. So it's a, a quid pro quo, but. That's only if someone needs hay locally. If too many farmers are not farming their land, and so there's no animals on the land, you need the hay for the animals. If there's no animals on the land, then people don't need the hay. So now, if there's no one who needs the hay, no one's going to hay it for free. And now, you as a farmer, are you going to want us to keep um, cutting, cutting, cutting it every year? It costs money now because you have to pay someone to do it because no one wants to do it for free. So no one wants it for the hay. So anyways, the point is that God Almighty is saying over here, I am going to take the, I'm going to try with these idolaters slowly so that the land should not revert to chaos. Even though, as we're going to see, that the leaving of the people in the land, in the Holy Land, the leaving of the idolaters in the Holy Land, practicing their idolatry, waiting for the time when it's the right time for the children of Israel to move into that particular part of the land, is of grave spiritual danger to the children of Israel and to the entire 
progress of the world, the spiritual and physical progress of the world, as we're going to see in a moment. So God Almighty is saying that this is so important, this principle of not allowing the desolation of the earth from human presence, that it should return to the wild, even temporarily, is of such importance that he will tolerate the continued presence of people who are, are committing idolatry and other immoralities and abominations that is something he's going to tolerate in order that it shouldn't go back to the wild. Now, you might say, but uh, maybe he's just doing this because he doesn't want to, you know, hag, uh, burden the Jewish people later on with, with you know, having to take a machete to cut down the bushes and, and the trees and stuff like that that grew in the meantime, and it's going to be extra labor and work for the Jewish people. And I could hear that argument. But the point, but the question is, if if it's going to be just merely that, um, that it's just a matter of uh, you know extra labor, so to speak, and 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 recovering the land. Well, it was conquered one time. It's not. It, it could be conquered for, for from a human perspective that it put into use for human productivity. Uh, it could be done again, and the second time's easier because the fields have already had their stones removed, and it's it's the, the trees could be used for um, for wood. So they could, they could they self could be productive and and the wild beasts, you know the wild beasts tend to move out quickly when they see you know op opposition and they see these people and they they shy away and they move back and in deeper and deeper into away and so forth. So I want to suggest that the it's it's not a, a saving the Jewish people children of Israel labor later on, but rather making sure that there's an un, there's no interruption between the use of the land. For the purpose of human benefit, there should be no interruption in that even temporary, even at the expense of slowing down the progress of the knowledge of oneness of God in the world. It's incredible, incredible important to understand what a God Almighty's priorities over here. So, given that, and then it continues with the um, the, the first that's verse thirty. I'll just so then um it says I'll drive as a consequence verse 30 says uh, in consequence of the intention of 29 I will drive them out from you uh, before you from little by little until you have increased and occupied land until you can't occupy it it's going to remain occupied until you could occupy it so that there should be no gap in the occupation of the land land needs to be occupied by human beings and particularly land that is already been developed by human beings and number 31, now, now you can understand why those that promote the agenda of a Moloch, which a Moloch's goal is to remove God from the world, God forbid, and that's to removing human beings from the world. And that starts by removing, God forbid, Jewish people from the world, the children of Israel, because we're the ones carrying this message. God forbid to any possibility of success and they, all their plans should be annulled. But they, they want to take God out of the schools. They don't want people to learn the Torah anymore. They don't want people to listen to the Jews. So every possible way to prevent people from hearing the children of Israel, what the Torah has to say, so that people don't see the simple meaning of the verses over here, that there's clearly a priority that the use of land for human productivity takes priority over everything else, even over the spiritual mission of bringing the world to the service of God Almighty and removing the idolatry from the world. That's why they don't want us to learn. They don't want people to learn this. Because you would then say you get your brochure from the, some group that wants to once you realize that their intention is to revert the land to <clears throat> desolation and fill it with wild beasts, you would you would want this clearly contradicts the Torah, and you cannot confuse even though one of the shevamets has been enoch is not to one of the commandments applies to every human being is not to eat the limb of the living animal. We're, we're not allowed to torture, be cruel, and so forth to, to animals, and, and we're not allowed even to just rip a leaf off a tree for no reason. Even absent mindedness, you can't go along and rip off leaves. As Friedrich Rebbe talks about his father, the Rebbe Rishab, rebuked, rebuked the previous Lubavitch Rebbe as a child not to, he was just walking along and just pulled a leaf off a tree, and how could you do that? God Almighty is creating this tree, this leaf is there for a purpose, a purpose and, and the purpose is not for you to just pull it off for no reason. 
So we are attuned to the fact that God Almighty is creating the entire universe for his glory. But we're commanded to subjugate it to the higher purpose of humanity. Because the higher purpose of humanity is fulfilling and bringing to the awareness of the entire creation the knowledge of God Almighty. And providing the dwelling, the the host, the human being is the host for the dwelling of the divine presence. So this is, we have to get this point across to ourselves so it becomes so obvious and our sense of priorities are so obvious so we could see where a Amalek is coming and fooling with us. So they're fooling us. They, they have sometimes people write articles about the, try to it's, say that Torah supports environmentalism because we can't eat the limb of a living animal and because we can't count, cut down fruit trees. And it, one second, why can't we eat the limb of a living animal? Because we can't be cruel to one of God's creations and we can't become cruel ourselves because if we eat the limb of a living animal, we're going to end up eating human beings, God forbid. And we can't cut down fruit trees. Why? Because fruit trees are needed for human beings. Part of the glory of God Almighty's creation, he creates these fruits and you can't destroy what's productive for humanity. You can't even cut down a fruit tree. You want to build your, you know, build your path or something? You can't cut you, you can't just cut down a fruit tree. So so it's this this is going to the core. What we're learning here is going to the core of existence core of the purpose of existence and we can see how many ways this idolatry that we we're hearing talking about idolatry and, and so many people here who are watching this and are participating are, are going to say that they they left the idolatry and they're not participating in idolatry and so forth and it's true but we're getting swept up into idolatry in other aspects even little things where we're told that for the sake of Mother Earth, we have to recycle and we're supposed to do this. And it all sounds appealing, but the it's an idolatry. It's coming from a mission to take us off track, to reorient our priorities. And we don't necessarily pay attention to that because we we... We accept the packaging, just like when people say, well, this is for your health. Health is a good thing. This is for the health of the planet. What? No, we're, not, we're not here to hurt the planet. It sounds like a good thing. Why not do this? But we don't realize that it's really intended. The inner core is idolatry. And they come with packaging to take you step by step. So we're going to make the boundary from the sea, the Red Sea, to the Sea of the Philistines, from the desert to the river. And I'll deliver the inhabitants of the lands into your hands, and you shall drive them out from before you. So there's a combination. God Almighty is going to send the fear before. His fear is going to go before the Jewish people. But also the Jewish people have this responsibility of the children, as the children of Israel to go through and, and be part of that process of driving them out. Then verse 32 says, Don't. Don't lichrois means to uh, covenant to establish a um, to make a a with the bris is really the covenant lichrois means to um, although it could mean to cut off but it's a a a marking point a demarcation point of this covenant to form a covenant with them. And it says, don't make a covenant, don't lahem, lahem, bris. don't make a, uh, don't form with them and with their gods a covenant. And then verse 33 says, don't let them to dwell in the land because they're going to cause you to sin against God Almighty. And then you will serve their gods, worship their gods, and it's going to be for you a stumbling. That's that's the saying the reason over there. So there's two parts. Don't make a covenant for them or their gods and don't let them dwell in the land. So, so now we see that God Almighty not driving them out all at one time is itself 
creating this dangerous situation where there's a temptation to create a covenant with him, create a temptation, temptation to create a covenant with their gods and temptation to dwell in the, let them dwell in the land. Because look, if God lets them dwell in the land until we get around to occupying the territory they're, then they're in, then uh, it can't, is it so bad? But yet we see that God Almighty, as we said before, put the priority on, even though you could be confused by this and tempted by this, seeing this, but he said he doesn't want the land to return to desolation. So notice over here, it says, don't make a covenant with them or for them and for their gods. So we have to understand what we're making a covenant with their gods. So we're going to look, let's look inside and we're going to see that the Orachim says over here, one of the great holy Torah sages that um, explained helped elucidate for us the Torah teachings from all generations. He says, so first, oh, first, so first of all, you have to understand that you, you we're going to see that you cannot make a covenant with them when their gods are, when they're still worshiping their gods. We're going to see that you could make a covenant with these people if they reject their gods and they agree to observe only the seven commandments that apply to every single human being. And not to worship any idols. I mean, we know there's more than seven commandments. There's the 30 commandments that's really this, included in the seven, and there's hundreds of commandments and details and so forth. But they, they're going to agree to do that, do these commandments, because God Almighty commanded them on Mount Sinai through Moses, our teacher. You can make a covenant with him. So it's as long as they're coming with this package of their gods, but then they, you can't make a covenant with them. But what is this concept of making a covenant with their gods? So the Orachim Akedish says, A person who makes, establishes a covenant with idolaters is as if he established a covenant with the idolatry itself. For two reasons. The first one. Because that in the end, you, people are going to stumble. Why is it Why is it a covenant with the people who are idolaters like the covenant with the idolatry itself? Because eventually, the end of the story is that people are going to stumble. Like it warns in the next verse, lest you, lest you should be um, turn away towards these idol, idols and begin to serve them yourself. Habes, the second reason, ki b'chinas ha'avei because an aspect of the idolatry encloses itself in the idolaters, those that serve it. So you're really, you're really covenanting. If the person does this, God forbid, is covenanting with their gods because they're, they've taken on a certain aspect of these false deities. So he continues, why does it say the word covenant at the end of the verse? To tell us that it's only forbidding the covenanting at the time as man as long as they are still attached to their idolatry, they have not yet accepted to leave their idolatry. So now we're going back to Abishtaif. And we see over here, Shinemar, the verse in the Chumash, verse chapter 23, verse. 32 in the book of Exodus, Lo lahem, lahem, bris, don't make a covenant with them and their gods. You should not make peace with them. And to leave them, be able to continue to practice their idolatry. Because these nations are the core of idolatry and the root of the idolatry. We're rooted we're, we're commanded to uproot idolatry, and all things that are used to serve idolatry from the world. We have to uproot idolatry and all things that are part of that service from the world. For the in the opinion of the chinuch, who's compiling the or, uh, ordering the mitzvahs that we mentioned over here, this is the ninety third ninety third in the in his order. He says this only applies this, this that you can't make a covenant with 
idolaters only applies to the seven nations because it appears in the context of discussing these seven nations that were the prior inhabitants of the land of Canaan, of the Holy Land. And then he continues and says, on the Medivh Ram, now on page Shimam Zayin, 347. On the Rambam, from the words of the Rambam in Maimonides, in the Parak Yud, in the 10th chapter of the Hilchas Akum, Hilch Aleph, the 10th chapter of the laws of idolatry in the first law, that anyone who serves idolatry, we are forbidden to make a covenant with him. Now, if we pull up the Rambam, look inside the Rambam over here, because now we know that this is it can't make a covenant with any idolater. You can't make a covenant with uh, the seven nations to make them pe- make with them peace and to leave them to serve idolatry, like it says the 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 verse that we just said. Now, it. It continues from this uh, something that the and, and people who want to uh, Amalek wants to attack the Jewish people and to scare non-Jews from learning Torah that applies to all humanity from the Jews. So they take out a, uh, all kinds of phrases from the Talmud and from the Torah and so forth and statements and they say, look, the Jews hate the non-Jews. And uh, all kinds of if you look at them and you look at the original, you'll find it is not what it's saying. And here, it ha- a reason I brought this, bring the Rambam, because he now uses this as an opportunity to discuss what your attitude, what the Jewish attitude of a Jew should be towards an idolater. He says, You see an idolater that's perishing. Lost or Tevea Benahar, like he's drowning in a river, swept away in a river, don't take him up. If you see that he's he's on the verge of dying, don't save him. Or But to kill him intentionally or to push him into a pit, it's forbidden. You can't do that to him, person. Even an idolater. He's not making war with us. If he's making war with us, we have a commandment that if someone comes to rise up against you, you have to kill him first. But here, you don't have to save him, but you can't cause him to die. So if you take this out of context, it sounds like there's this animus towards idolaters. And then if you, if, if a person defines the whole world is idolaters. It sounds like it's a an, an animus towards Goyim, towards the non for the towards the nations. Goyim means nations. Goy could refer to uh, in the singular to the Jewish people, or could sing to refer to a uh, a, a non Jewish nation. Goyim is also referred to um, could refer to the tribes of Israel, because it doesn't one of the prophets, but it's commonly used to refer to the non Jewish nations. So it sounds like a tremendous hostility. Let the guy drown. But one second here. Let's continue the what the Rambam says. What are we talking about? With the seven nations, Shiva Amim. This that you can't, you shouldn't save him, but you can't kill him, only applies to the seven nations, to the non Jews. But someone who's Jewish, who is an informer, a traitor, a denier of God Almighty, someone who, who rejects and fights against God Almighty from among the children of Israel. 
then it's a com it's a command it's a um re legal requirement to destroy him to by hand to kill him and to eliminate him because he is causing sorry he's, he's causing tremendous pain to the children of Israel who are on this mission to bring the knowledge of God Almighty to the God Almighty to the world. And this person is turning the Jewish people into the forces that want to fight against God and fight against the Jewish people. He's he's spreading disbelief and uncertainty among the Jewish people. And he's he's a Messiah and he's causing the people to, to turn away from God Almighty. So this is bringing destruction to the world because if you if you it's like it's like if you're in the, the command center and you have all the soldiers and all the soldiers are, are you know, some are on board, some are not on board. People, there's a certain malaise among the people. So you you try to get them, you try to get them back on track. But if the people within the core have this special mission, God Almighty is saying, go to the, the, the children of Israel, go and reach the entire world. And someone's causing disruption there and attacking them and informing on them to the people who wanted to stop this mission of the Jewish people. And he's he's confusing the Jewish people and spreading disbelief in God and attacking God and attacking, excuse me, attacking the beliefs and the traditions of the Jewish people. Then he has to be eliminated. So you have to understand that the Torah is telling us that this actually the attitude towards the non-Jewish idolater is much more tolerant than the attitude towards the Jewish idolater and the, the traitors and the, the, the deniers of God Almighty. So now you can understand if you if when these people spread these, these false ideas among the non-Jews to try to, and one of the reasons they do this, of course, is we talked about the purpose of anti-Semitic propaganda is to scare the Jews into thinking the world is hostile. But a non-Jew reads something taken out of context, and it says if the non-Jews, the, the, you know, I drowning, the idolatry is drowning, then just let them drown. It sounds it sounds so callous. But when you can can parrot contrast it with the attitude towards his own fellow Jew that he has to go and kill him intentionally if he has the same attitude and the same idolatrous and attitude and you see that this is not about um giving a pass to a Jew to act improperly and and a non-jew is somehow his life God forbid is worthless that's not the case God God forbid his life's not worthless. Just you don't have to now go put yourself in danger to save him, the the non-Jewish idolater, but you but you can't go and kill him. But the Jewish person that's that's fighting against God Almighty from within the children of Israel, he has to be eliminated. So that's what the Rambam is saying that the halacha is. So that's what we have to really understand over here. We have to look at these things in the original, look at them in context, and um, understand the entire picture. That's why I wanted to bring that here today, so that you could um, understand this. Now, I know there's some questions I'm going to take a look in a second. So I think of the... the um, Comment being brought over here is that Rabbi Shleif is bringing from the the, the Chinuch is a lot, many mitzvahs in the Torah appear more than one time. So in terms of the Chinuch preparing the list, um, then he's or he's taking it to the first appearance. That's why he's we started with quoting the Book of Exodus, and the Rambam is quoting it from the Book of Deuteronomy. Okay, I'm realizing here, and I, I want to look into this more because Rabbi Shleif is saying, according to the Rambam, he says this applies to all the nations of the world. But at looking at the Rambam, we say he sees uh, says this over here for the seven nations also, and um, so I want to 
uh, I want to look into that more. So God willing, I'll have a small thought on that or some response on that next week. But going back to Rabbi Shtaif, because he now bases this on the Rambam, he says it's apparent, it seems to be apparent from the words of the Rambam that call me Shavit that anyone who serves idolatry, we're forbidden to enter into a covenant with him. Nira, so it appears that also B'nai Noach, also non-Jews have to be careful of this. That they should not establish a covenant with idolaters. So a non-Jew cannot establish a covenant with idolaters. The Azara he matam del tedel v'edazara, because the the reason this this warning is that you shouldn't allow idolatry to be existing in the world. The afal gav the ein negaragim al zeh, even though there's no capital punishment for being entering into a covenant with an idolater. Kivan she ein based in shli soma misin lemisha kares bis, because there's no corresponding capital punishment for uh in in um for a court of the children of Israel to execute someone who established a covenant with idolaters. Hey, never that's included within the warning with Saich Oyed, and we could look into this more. Now, the footnote over here, 19 in the footnote says, Pirush, the Dasa Ramam Shehu Kailu Kol According to the Ramam, that includes all idolaters. Um, I want to suggest that that's what was added by the editor. I want to suggest that even according to, um, even according to those that say it's just the seven nations, because a, a, a non-Jew can't make a covenant with one of the seven nations either, um, because it's a commandment not to do covenants with them in the Holy Land. The question is: Does it apply on a global basis that anywhere in the world is forbidden to? Um, enter into a covenant with idolaters and it is that I believe here the bottom line that the Rabbi Shtaif is saying is yes it's forbidden for a non-Jew to enter into a covenant with idolaters anywhere in the world so this is very very important and the, the practical implications are enormous We the, the children of Israel should not be entering the covenants with idolaters not only in the Holy Land, but not anywhere also. Meaning to say, when the when um, there was actually a lot of controversy, for example, in in Israel about taking reparations money from from Germany, there were many who opposed it and refused to take it. Um, I don't know if this was their basis, but there's uh, covenants going on all the time that people are making, and they have to make sure that they're not made with idolaters. Now let's continue over here and do Simon Chav Ches, which is chapter 28. This is the next mitzvah according to the numeration in the Chinoch. Not to allow to dwell an idolater in our land. Shenemar. Like it says, and we go back here to the um, book of Exodus. It says, Lo yeshu don't let them dwell in the land. What's the reason? Because it's, they're going to become, uh, turn us away and they're going to become a stumbling block for us. It's forbidden to allow to remain an idolater in our land. Unless he puts aside his idolatry permanently. He renounces it, and he accepts upon himself to fulfill the seven commandments. So this is now uh, in the sixth um, halacha, chapter 10, he says that it's a forbidden to, to allow anyone to dwell in the land as an adulterer. Even a temporary dwelling Venerally, and it's apparent to me, that 
non-Jews, B'nai Noach, the children of Noach, are also warned not to allow the establishment and, and the endurance of idolaters amongst them. The Hamus Harim Hain al because the non-Jews are warned and commanded on dinim, on setting up justice. And they have to judge with, as a capital crime, with um, uh, execution by the sword, all those that are servants of idolatry. Therefore, they're forbidden to allow these people who are culpable and liable for the capital crime of idolatry, it's forbidden to allow them to remain among the non-Jews. And this also that the Torah wrote in this verse here that they're going to take you, they're going to cause you to go astray from me, from God Almighty. It's also relevant to B'nai Noach. The Torah repeats this warning. Because since the concept of the Zor is so severe, going to the core of the purpose of creation and the purpose of creation of man. And through this, that will create a covenant with them or allow them to let, live in the land. And come to serve idolatry and to deny the essential fundamentals of reality God forbid. I'm a safer Eila Mitzvah. You can see further in the book, Holy Book, Sefer uh, Eila Hamitzvah. So, this is not even allow a temporary dwelling. So we see how far off the way in which the Holy Land is being conducted. That. Not only are idolaters not prohibited from being there, but they're being encouraged to be there. And the, and the government encourages the building of places of idolatry and invites idolaters to come and invites idolaters to come on a temporary basis, invite idolaters to set up shop there on a permanent basis, even though they claim that they're restricted or they're told they can't missionize the Jewish people. Uh, but the fact of the matter is they... It's forbidden to allow idolatry to be established, even if they say they're not going to missionize the Jewish people. And there's plenty of evidence that they don't fulfill their promises and they do missionize the Jewish people. And, and it says, don't allow them to stay there because they're going to lead the Jewish people astray and the Jewish people will come to serve that idolatry. It is not specifically referring to even missionizing. Just the fact that you allow them to stay is already now creating a permissibility and a allowance for that idea and what they believe and you're saying it's okay and to have it there and that's going to cause people to create a space what do they believe and they get into conversations and the end of the day then people will be led astray even if they're not um intentionally missionizing the these uh worshipers of idolatry so we have a very very severe situation and and those that are screaming um, I, I saw there's a group out there that's, you know, all pro um, these groups and the, their relationship with uh, Israel and so forth. And then they're like, but it's the outrageous, the missionizing. Well, the Torah already told us, if you allow idolaters into the land of Israel, they're going to have an effect on the Jewish people. You cannot have it both ways. You can't say, oh, it's going to be, okay, you're violating God Almighty's command not to let them be there. And then you're complaining that they're having a negative effect on the Jewish people. That's just a sad state of affairs of the confusion of these Jewish organizations. As well-meaning as they might be, they're just confused because they don't understand what God is saying. They're saying that they want a close relationship with idolaters. They want the money from the idolaters. They want the international support from the idolaters. And then they're complaining how terrible it is that they're going ahead and missionizing the Jewish people. But the Torah says, don't let them stay in the Holy Land because they will affect the Jewish people, lead them astray, and cause them to end up serving the idolatry. So everything God said is happening. So there's something so confused and so off base and not according to the Torah in the position of those people protesting the missionaries while at the same time encouraging and supporting and applauding the presence of the idolaters. 
another point to realize from this, if you look in the Rambam later on over here, it says, it's not contrasting some of that. We don't have the moment to go into all the details earlier, but it's saying the contrast. Some things apply only in, in the era when Israel's in exile among the idolaters or in an era where the idolaters are in power. When, however, Israel's in power over them, she had, uh, when it says, I will bizman shiyad Yisrael to keep When Israel the hand of Israel is in power over them, is stronger over the idolaters. It's forbidden. It's forbidden to allow idolaters to stay among us. Even someone who's going to sit temporarily or is traveling from place to place on business, he can't come into the land. He has to first accept the Shabbat Zubinoch. And it says, by the way, in the times of the temple, the tribe of Zulin, which was into international trade and uh, traveling the oceans and so forth, they would have their counterparts come from different countries to to part of the trade. The ships, the foreign ships, would come, and they would take those non-Jewish sailors and 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 uh, businessmen to the temple and teach them about God Almighty. They would teach them to know that there's nothing besides God Almighty because they they knew that they can't let them just come and visit as tourists. You can't let tourists. Idolatrous tourists come. First, he has to accept that there's nothing besides God Almighty and that he's going to accept the commandments through, as given on Mount Sinai, through a teacher's mo by God Almighty through a teacher Moses. And then he goes on to discuss the person who accepts these, uh, has permission to stay in the land, called the Gertesha, a special status of a non Jew who's a, a, a resident dweller in the Holy Land, he's allowed to stand to stay in the Holy Land because he's accepted these Shabbat Mitzvah. So he's like a Ben Noyach that has a residency permit. A Hasidi Umus Elam who has a residency permit in the Holy Land by virtue of his having um, this... Uh, and this uh, taken on the Shabbat Mitzvahs, and he says over here this concept of accepting a person as a resident, um, giving a person a residency permit, a non Jew residency permit, under these conditions only applies in the 50 uh, times of the Jubilee, and um, we can't only have, other than that, uh, in times now, we don't have the Jubilee year practiced, um, only accept full converts, Gerrit Sedek not the Gertesha. So that the still everyone still has a status and has is a is a ben Naya, has a status to become a Hasid Umas Elam. And we said before he can reach the Holy of Holies that the Ramam writes everyone could take upon themselves the Aveda of the tribe of Levi. So uh but this particular residency permit is not even available without the um without the Jubilee year in effect. So we also see that that, but however, oh, we can see that we have to ask ourselves a question. What's really happening in the Holy Land right now? He says, if the Jewish people have the upper hand over the stewardship of the Holy Land, then they're not allowed to let anyone dwell there. Yet we see that the idolaters are not only allowed to dwell there, they're encouraged and they're given encouragement to come and visit and stay and build places of worship. So we have to understand that reality, there's just a mirage that the Jewish people are running the Holy Land. It's not, Yad Yisrael Tekifa here, it's not Jewish people are not really in charge of the Holy Land because they're not running it as would be done if the Jewish people were really in charge of the Holy Land. They're running it in a way that indicates that, that they're not the, Jew, the, the Jewish people living according to the Torah do not have the upper hand at all. So we have to, we could see this as, as and the Rebbe said this also in regards to after the Six Day War, because it says the Korban Pesach, the Paschal offering, it's brought in the eve of Passover, can be brought even without the Third Temple in the time when the Jewish people are in dominion of the Holy Land. And that can be brought even when the, with the majority of the congregation is impure, then it can be brought even in the state of impurity. 
So immediately after 1967, the following year, 1968, Passover, the Rebbe instructed, advised his followers that they should not be found in the borders of this holy city of Jerusalem uh, before Passover and the time of the bringing of this offering because they are very possibly obligated in bringing this Passover offering because the conditions are right. And since there's not a mindset to allow them to do that, and it's they wouldn't necessarily know all the details, so better they should not be present. They should be out of town, so to speak, on that day. But by 1969, which was now the second Passover, the Rebbe withdrew that instruction or that encouragement to leave because he said it is clear that the Jews no longer have the upper hand. Whatever appearance of having had the upper hand after the victory of the Six-Day War was only either temporary or illusory in the first place. And they it's not being run according to uh, uh, what, what would be done if the Jews really had the upper hand. It's being um, actually run according to whatever the other nations say to do. And it's being, the Jewish people are already offering the Israeli government, not the Jewish people, because Jewish people would never do such a thing, but the Israeli government is offering up the land that was miraculously brought into the hands of Jewish people. In 1967 war, they're already offering it up to the enemies of the Jewish people as uh, peace offerings for peace deals. And even without the other nations, after having defeated the other nations and having taken it legitimately in a, in a war to uh, to defend the Jewish people and to conquer the places that were being used, the places of attack on the Jewish people, um, the Rebbe said they're already offering it back. Clearly, they're not in charge. They don't even view themselves in charge. They're just they're trying to give it away. So we see that the Yad Yisolo to and we see also here the conduct towards the idolaters is also uh, indicative that they're allowing them and they're not they're not exercising any the proper authority of the Jewish people over the Holy Land is to exclude idolaters even on to come on a temporary basis and that since that's not being done we see that this this imagery this illusion that somehow there's a you know Jewish state is really an illusion because it's not being run in a way that indicates the decisive leadership of the Jewish people in the world and therefore it is not the Yad Yisolo B'tikivah the hand of the Jewish people is not on the upper hand in the Holy Land at this time now someone asked the question are Christians who live in Israel considered idolaters and yes the answer is yes because the Christianity has many aspects of idolatry not only worshipping a trinity but also believing in a force of evil, independent force of evil. They believe that the Satan rebelled against God and became the, the one that has dominion over the earth. That is idolatry, absolute explicit idolatry, to believe that there's any independent force other than God Almighty. And they believe in what they call original sin, that man is created evil at his outset. That's a that's a terrible fight against God Almighty to, to, to desecrate the his greatest creation, which is humanity, and claim that they're born in sin. Simply false. It's a it's a it, it goes against the core of the Torah, which is talking about that the pure the essence of man is godliness. Created in God Almighty's divine image and that every human being has a soul. And among the children of Israel there's an additional soul of the of the children of Israel. Or it's a soul that comes more to the forefront in the children of Israel. And so Christianity has all kinds, and that Christianity rejects the uh, all the teaching of the of the oral Torah, the Torah sages through all time, all the all the Torah that was given by God Almighty to Moses on Mount Sinai, they reject. So they're rejecting God Almighty, rejecting his Torah. Rejecting his teacher Moses, rejecting all the successors to Moses in every generation. So it is 
um, it is a it's all it's all idolatry. Um, so they didn't. So in 1969, they did not give up land for peace. They wanted to. In response to the question over here, was that considered a covenant? Well, it was an offer of a covenant. Um, but in later times, and tragically, land was given up. In 1979, with Camp David. Later on, with Oslo and and uh, the Gaza and so forth. Not even waiting for a covenant, just unilaterally delivering. First of all, demolishing Jewish communities, deporting Jews, and then delivering it to. Uh, Amalek's um, murderous terrorists, Marxist terrorists in the, the Gaza Strip and so forth. Um, this, uh, can Kol Nidre break that? No, Kol Nidre cannot break oaths taken with other people. Um, There's uh, this a common misconception. And uh, I can send you, if you want, there's, um, I could post a link to the explanation of Kol Nidre. It's a very, very vital point. A person has to keep his word. And uh, you cannot use Kol Nidre to get out of what you commit to. Um, someone writes here, the Christians of Israel today are like the Greeks of the past to destroy the soul of the Jews, cutting them off from the God Almighty. Well, the fact of the matter is that Christianity is trying to mislead the world into a misconception of God Almighty. Taking away people's birthright to know that God Almighty loves them, is loving them, recreating them every single instant, and turning that into an idea that, that they're abandoned and they're, they're lost unless they somehow um, accept a human sacrifice, allegedly on their behalf. These are all um, false ideas. That's all a darkening of humanity and misleading humanity. So that nothing's changed about that, wherever the wherever it's located. Um, how about the Messianic Judaism group? Are they also idolaters? There are many different variations, but some of them are taking teachings from Hasidic teachings. Well, Mess, Messianic Judaism, if you're referring to a group that believes in uh, Jesus as a redeemer. You uh, first of all, if they are, the question is, are they are they uh, believing that he is part of God? Is he the is he the son? I mean, it's the it's the most untragic thing for someone to focus on Jesus as the son of God when God Almighty already said that Bnei Bechayi Bnei Yisrael that the whole children of Israel are the son of firstborn son of God. So the the Jewish people are the the, the children of Israel, the firstborn son of God. To come along and say that Jesus is the Son of God is to deny God's statement that the that the entire people of Israel are the firstborn son of God. As number one, number two is, if the children of Israel are the firstborn son of God, it means that the rest of humanity is also the sons of God. Right? If there's a firstborn, there's others born also. So every human being is the son of God. the The Jewish people are the firstborn son of God because they have this elder brother fatherly responsibility for the entire humanity. So that is, first of all, to, to refer to, in addition to the idolatry of included in the concept that he's the son of God, is also a denial of the truth that the Jewish people is the firstborn son of God, which is not an idolatry because we're not, God is not claiming that we're, we're, we're gods. He's saying that you, uh, all human beings are my the God Almighty's direct offspring. Meaning to say, He brought man into existence, and He has uh, this relationship of a father to His children. So, so Christianity is coming along with this terrible deception to to, to call, talk about the Son, that Jesus is the Son, when He's the, the, basically the disowning the rest of humanity from their relationship with their Father, and they're, they're trying to displace the Jewish people as the firstborn son of God. Um, so that's number one. Number two is that if you you have to, and I, I'm not saying you should look into what they're saying, but uh, they're, they're, if they're talking about he's the messianic redeemer, obviously that's false. We can learn in the Rambam what is the qualifications to be the messianic redeemer, which Jesus did not meet. Uh, not then, not since then, and doesn't qualify. 
in addition if they now if if they're just claiming that they're Jew, they're jewish and they just believe he's the already come messiah then that's just that that's a mistake and the question is you have to understand while they may profess that or claim that that's what they believe but they're part of a movement that is promo is, is promoted by idolaters and the in the idolaters mind the only salvation is to accept that human being as the god so while this messianic jew might claim that he is not believing that jesus is the god but he's believing he's just the redeemer and so forth but he's part of a it, it's he can't believe what he's saying first of all he might be lying to you as to what he believes because they're trying to attract jews who uh believe in a messiah but would never accept a um a, a human god so they stay tone it down and they say well okay leave aside jesus being the god they just take up jesus as the messiah so it's it's a it's a cult of dishonesty and it's a cult of falsehood because it's not only is it false to say that jesus is the messiah but it's false to claim and, and, and to believe that he's god but it's false to claim that they're lying and deceiving people to say that they don't really believe that he's the God. He's just the Messiah. And he's therefore he is, uh, it's, it's safe to participate in this. So yeah, I believe that there is a, a um, this idolatry is baked into the, what they're calling Messianic Judaism. Um, there are in terms of what teachings they're taking, they're going to take any teaching that appeals to people to try to package in a way that's going to make people feel at home. Jewish people feel at home that they're not straying from the traditions of their forefathers. It sounds like what they're learning is what they're very similar to what they're learning in, uh, in other Jewish sources or Jew authentic Jewish sources or in, in an authentic Torah place of learning. So people are going to be confused and they're going to say, well, this is, you know, uh, this is, they don't see the differences or they think they get swept up into it for whatever reason. They don't know enough. Um, is proselytizing Christian illegal in Israel? Yes, I believe missionizing by Christians is supposed to be illegal in Israel. Um, I I believe that that illegality of it is really a ploy of the of the state to allow to to convince the Torah observant Jews to let down their their the outrage and opposition to this encouraging of Christian uh, people and sites and so forth to come and build in the Holy Land by saying, oh, they're not going to missionize. So people say, well, if they're not missionizing, it's not a threat. Um, but it's, it's not that the state is intending to keep the land holy. The state doesn't believe in the holiness of the land. The state does everything to repudiate the holiness of the land, only allows... You know, has rabbis and state rabbis and state, you know, the functionaries and the, and the armed forces and so forth, keeping a very superficial level, a token level of belief in order to placate the 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 Jews into thinking that it somehow has a, this this enterprise has a connection to the God of Israel and to the Torah, but it's. It's not their intention not to make it holy at all. They're doing everything to make it not holy. But they do things, say, okay, let the, invite the idolaters in, or just they can't missionize. So people say, okay, it can't be so bad. They're going to stay over there in their own building. But it's all a lie because we're learning that just having them in their own building, minding their own business, so to speak, and their idolatry is itself going to lead the Jewish people astray and cause them to follow after it. And we said that not only is the, the covenanting with them and with their gods is why is it them and their gods because the, the, or Haim says when you're making a covenant which i you could perhaps suggest that saying to a person come and build and here's a piece of land for you and all this kind of stuff and here's the you get to have this and this exemptions from taxation all these kind of things are really like a covenant so the extent that their their idols are and clothed within them, a person says that these governments are really making covenants with the idolatry itself, in addition to the, with the idolaters. Um, the Messianic are the most in dangerous state because they have stolen the traditions, the language, and even appearance in some cases, and have caused so much damage. Yeah, well, you know, it's 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 part of the tragedy of our times that 
Um, people are lost. People are not learning Torah. And when we're not doing enough to spread the knowledge of God Almighty among the non-Jews, then the non-Jews are able to try to influence the Jews and take the Jews off the track. So we have to increase our efforts. And I want to speak about that briefly as soon as we finish the questions over here. But what we could do to increase that teaching and reaching um, our goals of reaching every single human being. Um, are the Jews for Jesus considered Christian or were they Jewish first? Is this why Messianic Judaism can impersonate tradition and practice of the Jewish people? So, um, so I think Jews for Jesus, Jew, uh, Jews for Jesus at its core is a Christian mission. It's like a Christian mission to the Jews, um, and it is Christianity at its core. And um, but some of the people involved were Jewish by birth, um, and they can, um, you know, Jews have unfortunately, if you go back in history, there were Jews that became traitors and they became instigators within the Christian orders, and they led the persecutions of the Jewish people, in many cases. Uh, terrible, uh, terrible, terrible history of that. And uh, this, is, this, this is a continuation of this. While it doesn't have the, um, you know, the drama of burning people at the stake and the Inquisition and so forth, but it's spiritually burning people at the stake. It's coming and telling people that they should follow a false god. Um, but this fact that they draw in this deception organizations, they draw on people with Jewish background. They have a certain, you know, Jewish flavor to them, even if they're totally ignorant um, in their upbringing. But they they might look Jewish and they might um, have certain Jewish languaging and things that would make them look and give a certain air of. Um, authenticity to to what they're doing tragically um okay question over here can we say that christianity has a lot at least brought a large part of humanity from all the older idolatries somewhat closer to judaism preparing the part of humanity for entering into judaism meaning to say that this is so, so this is something the Rambam says Rambam says that we can't. There's no greater stumbling block and darkness brought upon the humanity than Christianity, and um, and also Islam has taken people away from the truth because even though it says that there's one God, but it's taking people away from the Torah as uh, as the source of that um, the divine communication. So the Rambam says that we can't understand why God Almighty has done this, other than to suggest that through. Christianity and Islam, they have brought about the knowledge of um, one God in the case of Islam and the messianic redemption in the case of Christ Christianity to large, to the majority of humanity. Um, and that they are, and Judaism already includes every single human being uh, because it has one system of knowing there's nothing besides God Almighty. There's one God for every single human being. Um so yes, that's what the Rambam says. Um, so the, the response that someone wrote over, no, because Christians still keep up the ancient idolatry just packaged in a more current and acceptable design. So this is something that the Rambam did not point out. It's a very interesting point that a lot of the idolatry of Christianity, um, that Christianity incorporates pagan idolatries and the practices and so forth. It, it's kind of like a mixture that they try to steal and imitate the um, the Torah and the practice of the Jewish people with their um, the church, you know, being structured according to the teachings of the Torah in terms of the temple and so forth, and trying to be replacement theology. A lot of that false ideology, and then also at the same time bringing in to attract. That's where they get their sort of claim their authority from, and then to attract the masses, they brought in all kinds of already accepted idolatries. So you have Ishtar, the idolatry of Ishtar, the wife of um, Nimrod. Nimrod and his wife set themselves up as gods. She was the goddess, goddess of fertility. That's practiced today as Easter. Ishtar, Easter. Um, then you have uh, the, a lot of the practices around the, the winter solstice. Also, idolatrous practice, pagan practices, and so forth. 
And, um, but that doesn't, you know, the, the Raman doesn't really address that because the he's he's focusing on the core of the fact that at some level there is a awareness in all corners of the world of the God of Israel. And that, however, we should not rest on the laurels of that because two things. Number one is that they know about the God of Israel, but in a, they've learned in a distorted way from Christianity. So they have to now know the truth. The God of Israel is was always for every single human being and already had a covenant with every single human being. There was no need for a new covenant. And that's number one. Number two is to realize that the effect that Christianity tempor temporarily had in partially moralizing the world, um, bringing the Torah teachings to the world and partially moralizing, although Christianity didn't always conduct itself according to the rules against murder and so forth in the Torah, by, for example, murdering other human beings and murdering Jews, um, nevertheless, there's a certain general standard of, of morality and not stealing and so forth that was brought about in Christian uh, domains. But all that is history. Christianity barely offers any um, you know, moral structure to, to uh, those that are in its domains. And we see that Christianity on a daily basis is becoming more and more openly aligned with Marxism and with Amalek um, in, in its very fundamental beliefs. So that's accelerating. So we have to recognize that. So, so two things. One is to say, oh, the Christians, uh, you know, they're, they're close on some points. Can't rest on it. Number one is the, the, the demand for Mashiach is that it has to be 100 percent true. Number two is that if you're expecting the Christians to hold humanity to its moral compass, it's just not happening. Christianity is been infiltrated from the inside out, and uh, and and even and then and then even among the Christians who you could say they hold by traditional teachings, whether it's in the traditional churches or um or in the some of the traditional protestants um they have all kinds of infiltrated ideas that lead to their own inability to actually take effect because they preach for example one of the preachings of christianity is that the world is unredeemable and that they they anticipate the descent of the world into chaos but they're going to be rescued from it so there's kind of like this defeatist approach while they have hope that they're going to be rescued, but they don't have any hope to turn around the situation, which is opposite the Torah. The Torah says, no, we have belief that every human being can turn around at this moment, and my job is to be the one who's going to be the catalyst for that change for myself and my family and for everyone around me, Jew and non-Jew. So the Christian, by even though he says he believes in God and he believes in uh, leaving aside all his confusion, the idolatry, and, and and unfortunately the tragic belief in the independent force of evil, which is part of this defeatist idea that they believe in, um, and, and the belief in the original sin, all these false ideas, but they still believe in you know the do not murder and do not steal and stuff like that to a certain extent, although that's questionable because uh, what to what extent they believe the Ten Commandments and uh, uh, as they understand that even still applies, given that Jesus says he came to fulfill the law and what all that means. In terms of whether there's still commandments, a lot of Christians don't even believe in current commandments. They just believe in a relationship with Jesus. Um, but nevertheless, even though they may on a day-by-day -day basis m conduct themselves uh, by not murdering and not stealing and so forth, yet they are abandoned. Their vision is abandoning the world. They abandon the world. They don't see themselves as able to bring about the change and they prepare themselves they have you can watch videos on youtube you know preparing for um the you know the torture of being the you know the last remnants of christianity as the world descends because they're seeing themselves as the the uh minority grow, uh, smaller and smaller, smaller minority as they see things collapsing around them but they didn't have the moral strength in the united states of america to prevent taking god out of the school system so you have to realize it's an emergency life and death emergency that people there is no 
we, 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 those that learn the Torah can't say, oh, don't worry, the Christians are keeping everyone in the proper moral conduct. No. Even, even what was 30 years ago, certain reverence among the people has dissipated in the vast majority of cases. So that is an urgent call for us to um, speed, speed up our work. Okay, now, uh, it's confusing that the Israeli government doesn't treat Israel like the Holy Land given to the Jewish people by God. Well, that is definitely confusing, and that's the intention. The intention, the intention is to confuse people. The intention was never to treat the land like the Holy Land. Zionism was created as a as an offshoot of Marxism in order to convince the Jewish people to abandon the ways of their forefathers and to focus with the illusory appeal of focusing on one aspect of Torah, which is to occupy and inhabit the Holy Land and offer that as a solution to all Jewish suffering. That if they would only go to the Holy Land, they wouldn't have to suffer under the Tsar and under the pogroms and all these different terrible situations. But it was offered as a way to evacuate the Jews from those lands and leave those lands without any Jewish influence and to bring the Jewish people to the land of Israel to create a Marxist state um, that was going to now further confuse the Jewish people. So uprooting the people from their traditional teachings and then bringing them into the hands more closely into the hands of the Marxists in the state of Israel, which is run as a Marxist state, Marxist education system, Marxist economic systems, um, the whole anti, anti-religious. If you look at it, the, the whole goal of those that Herzl and so forth that started Zionism was really to tear down Judaism, to destroy Judaism. They themselves did not practice. They didn't have their children practice. A lot of their children converted into Christianity, um, grandchildren and so forth. Really, really a war against God and the Jewish people. And But it's, it's it, it succeeded in confusing a lot of Jewish people to thinking that it's the answer. It provides a certain level of Jewish sense of uh, you know self-reliance. And then they invented something called religious Zionism, was because real Zionism in, in, the, in its raw form was repulsive to the Torah observant Jews. So they came up with something called religious Zionism, which basically says, okay, well, you could be a Zionist and still do some of the traditional things of the previous generation, put on tefillin, keep Shabbos, and so forth. But by their mode of dress and the way that they they teach and so forth, that they they do reject the teachings of the Torah sages of of the generations of, in many cases, they, they really reject it in their dress and they specifically wear clothing to say that they're different. They're not following in the traditions of their um of, of their of their grandfathers. And um so that's confuses the world. Confuses the world into thinking that this is the answer. They think that it's being conducted that, that Holy Land is the Jewish homeland. I mean that's what God Almighty says. But it's been co-opted by people who are not interested in God or the Jewish people or the Torah or the well-being of the non-Jews. The, the Marxist revolution seeks to destroy all human beings equally, God forbid. And that's what, if you look at the parties, the outright Marxist parties in, the, in Israel, I mean, it would be, they, they, in America, the Marxist parties can't even dare to be so openly Marxist. But in Israel, there's open Marxist parties, Stalinist parties, um, and they're they're the ones that are surrendering the land. They're the ones that are building up terrorism to, to fight against God and to fight against the Jewish people, to fight against the Arabs that live in the Holy Land. So, yes, you are confused, and we're all subject to being confused because that is the intention. It's an intentional act of confusion. Would you say, Rabbi Smith, the dialogue is important between the different traditions, Judaism mostly presented, represented by reformed conservative liberal strands and the Messianics, church and Islam, as well as the Buddhist monks, etc. Or one should one's energy be devoted in a focused way? So, um, first of all, reform is not part of Judaism. Conservative is is not part of the Judaism. They're, they're, these are not Jewish movements. They are foreign movements that were invented in order to like, provide a sense of not completely leaving Judaism to Jews who were um, being enticed by the 
a desire to assimilate. Reform is about rejecting the Torah, rejecting God, and believing that the Torah is not a divine gift from God Almighty. It's it's antithetical to the entire teachings of Judaism. So it has nothing to do with Judaism. It has the it has certain Jewish terminology and Jewish things that that are also confuse people. Um, and same thing with conservative. Conservative was formed after reform was not getting ground because it was too radical for people. People did not want to leave the traditions of their forefathers to, this, to the degree which reform was requiring of them. Um, and therefore, they were not subject to being um, taken away. Uh, so they came up with conservative, which is, you know, traditional conservative. The word conservative sound like that they're going to keep some of the things and the, the end result is the same. Um, and and we see they become more and more progressive by the day, becoming they more and more reveal what they're really about. There's no no real difference between what they're teaching and what uh, Marxist churches are teaching. Um, but as Marxism is willing to um, be chameleon and present itself you have the liberation theology you have reform theology you have whatever it is whatever it takes to get the people to support with their time money and energy um that they will present themselves that way because that's how you seduce people into it and the liberal strands i mean there's uh, unfortunately so many different variations but they're all representing the same concept and now they're claiming that they're still keeping torah true to the torah but uh, these liberal but they are pushing mighty Marxist ideology. Um, and uh, Messianics and church and Islam, as well as the Buddhist monks, etc. So the I, I don't know who you're saying um, should have a dialogue. But first of all, among the the Messianic, Jew, this Messianic is, is, is complete falsehood because it's, it's presenting something that's false as not what it is. So uh, outright falsehood, at least you can know what you're looking at. Messianic is presenting as something is false on top of falseness. Um, the concept here is that the, generally speaking, that the concept of dialogue, what's the dialogue about? Meaning to say, um, the concept of dialogue is a, is a dia, die means two. And as opposed to a monologue, you're going to have a dialogue. But there's a, a, a perception, like using the word dialogue, that the two things are equal. And they're given equal status, and now we're going to have a dialogue. What do you say? What do I say? So that, that's not the Torah approach. The Torah approach is that there's one God, and he has one message for all of humanity. And that message doesn't have any other, doesn't leave room for any other um possibilities there's no possibility of having a conversation with someone who believes in two gods or believes that the sun is the one god it's there's no dialogue now we see that the Ramam says over here that um you know you could say hello to somebody and do things that are we're not um and not talking to these human beings on the contrary our job is to bring them the knowledge of god almighty but we're not having a dialogue now, we're not going to sit down and say, oh, Mr. Priest, what do you think? Let me tell you. The rabbi is going to know. In fact, we're not allowed, Torah, Torah says, we're not allowed to be, even sit on a committee with people from other, um, from, from idolatries. So um, there is there is no room for idolatry. What there is room for, and the, and the directed energy you're talking about, the, is focused, devoted focus energy, is to talk to people and say, here's what the Torah has to say. And if you haven't heard it before, I apologize that the Jewish people were busy trying to survive under the threats of persecution by Mr. Priest, your religion. Uh, but now that you've uh, lost lost your fervor, in your beliefs that you don't even have any more real fervent beliefs, let me tell you what the truth is. And that is that there's nothing besides God Almighty. And you need to understand what God Almighty wants from you. And that answer is found in the Torah as carried and lovingly preserved by the Jewish people for all these generations without changing even one single letter and one single word and without, without adapting to the times. The Torah doesn't adapt to the times because human beings are created 
the way we are by God Almighty without he doesn't create us to adapt we're, we're not the human the human divine image in us the divine image in the human being hasn't adapted there's no there's no change in the world that uh, the, the Torah needs to adapt to there is swings back and forth between reverence and connection to God Almighty and recognition of people's source that they're created by the infinite creator by God Almighty and that he speaks to men and he speaks specifically through Moses our teacher there's people at times when people are more like that and the people when people are rejecting that walking away from that lose sight of that but that's not a change in the times that's not a change in the situation the Torah has to adapt to it's because the Torah, voice of the Torah is not being said clearly and honestly and Exactly enough. So we that's what we have to focus our energy on. That's what we're here doing at RabbiSmith.org. Um, someone wrote here in a comment in response to the previous question, there can't be any common ground with any of those. Correct. Our devotion should be to Hashem alone. Correct. Finding common ground is a trap. Correct. Uh, I would refer someone to Rabbi Singer, Rabbi Skobek. Correct. Rabbi Singer, Rabbi Skobek. They spend their time refuting the falsehoods of Christianity. And I don't spend a lot of time on that because I'm here to teach about the oneness of God Almighty, and if anyone has a question about uh, what what it means, this particular verse is here and there, then you can. Rabbi Singer has done an excellent job of compiling all the the false translations and all the deceptions of the the churches to deceive people as to what the Torah says. And you could read about it in his uh, Outreach Judaism or website in his book called Let's Get Biblical. Um, response over here. I know that it can be a trap, but when one is in the front line, not belonging to any group tradition, one has to deal with criticism, slandering from the previous group one used to belong to. Well, there's that's that's what everyone has experienced. Um, but it doesn't mean you can't have a conversation, but the conversation has to be a one-way conversation, meaning to say you can let the other person speak, but the answer is not to say, oh, oh you believe, well, we believe this, and I guess they're both very similar. No, the answer is they're not very similar. You can't show any similarities between Judaism and Christianity. God forbid. To say, for example, that human beings are created as evil at their core at the beginning is something that's so false. It's like it's repulsive to the Torah. It's repulsive to Judaism. So you can't say there's a commonality between the two. We know that every human being is commonality between every human being because we know we all have one father and God Almighty created us all in his divine image. And we're all from one human father and one human mother. And they're both created by God Almighty. We're all being created by God Almighty lovingly at every instant. So now we know that. So we know that we have commonality with that human being. Let me touch him in his commonality. Let me speak to him where he is the divine in him. But I'm not going to have a uh, a discussion creating the appearance of any commonality um, between truth and what's not true. Now, the, we know that Torah ideas were dissipated into the entire world. They were picked up by Christianity, by Islam, by Eastern religions and so forth. It says that Abraham had 10 sons after Sarah passed away and with Hagar, and they, he sent them to the East. If you read Lao Tzu and you read different writings of the, uh, Chi and the Chinese um, philosophers and so forth, you'll see a lot of Torah ideas in there and stuff incredibly um, that are seems like it's just taken out of Pirkei Aves, the ethics of the fathers. And um, the reason is because it is. Meaning to say that the teachings of the ethics of the fathers are were passed from generation to generation, and many of those teachers ended up in the East, either, for example, the sons of Abraham. He taught his children, ten sons these teachings. They went and, and uh, went to the East. And then there were traits, and there were interactions and so forth, and those teachings then became any, any common sense man from china would hear a teaching that sounds true it, it is true it resonates with him he would then begin to teach it so there's a there's a common tradition first of all of from the first man had the same rec the one recognition of the one god and that is passed and available to every human being and some kept to more more kept to it more authentically than others and then there's the teachings people came across the Jewish teachings where the Jewish people kept that authentically and other people, non-Jews, came across that and that, that reawakened in them those authentic teachings. Um, Rabbi Smith, when a non-Jew was not in the conversion path, reform conservative is the only place that one could go for corporate worship. 
I do see the beauty and power of praying alone as a Kodesh Baruch who is close when one cries out in sincerity and truth, but a corporate worship is very powerful too. Chabad houses maybe open up a bit more to non-Jews. Well, this is a definitely a challenge. And as, as a human being, you want to pray. It says, my house is a prayer for all the nations and, and, and the person is going to gravitate to where they welcome. And if the place of falsehood is welcoming them, it's tempting because it seems to be um, aligned with Judaism and, uh, by name. And uh, it's allowing communal prayer. I don't know why he's word corporate, but communal, I think, is a more appropriate. The tzibur, the tzibur is the, the, col the collection of the people, the community. And it is hugely troublesome and an obstacle that if, if Torah authentic places of prayer are saying they don't have the capacity, they don't have the, um, they don't seem to have the willingness to open their doors to all the non-Jews that want to come and pray as non-Jews without any intention of converting. I just had a conversation with one such rabbi recently. And I'll just briefly share with you the, the insights that we could see that the challenges that a person is facing. He, he's in a small town in the southern United States, and he gets calls from non-Jews all the time. Now, one of the things he pointed out, and I, I see this myself, but I have I have a um see the same thing, but I have a different vantage point. What he sees, which is accurate, you have Christians calling all the time, non-Jews calling all the time, and they have a wide range of beliefs. Some believe in Jesus, some don't believe in Jesus, some believe in, in the Torah, some believe in the Jesus, and that they believe that they can hold that with the Torah, and there's people with that uh, think uh, there's truth in um, in the, you know different Eastern uh, religions, and there's people that started you know, dabbling in Islam. So many people. He specifically mentioned the Christians. I was just expanding the list. So you get a guy who calls up as a Christian. He wants to have a discussion. So what's what's his intention? This person's intention is it to come to learn sincerely about the oneness of God. Or does he want to try to convince the rabbi to be a Christian? Is he a missionary? So how much time does a rabbi have for these discussions, right? He's got to try to reach all the Jews in his region, and he has limited resources. He may not have a full-time salary from his own Chabad house. He could be, for example, doing kosher supervision on the side to make money to put food on the table for his family. Because it's a small community. Maybe there's only 100 Jews in the entire community. So he doesn't have, even if they all gave him a nice generous check every month, he wouldn't may, might not be able to sustain himself. So he's going and taking, so he's got other time commitments. Now he's going to try to build a community. There's no Jewish, authentic Jewish infrastructure in this place. He's going to gather together three Jews and he's going to bring them to a Shabbos table. And hopefully that three Jews are going to turn into eventually be 10 Jewish men that he can make a prayer service. And there's going to be, their families are going to come and their children are coming to start a Jewish day school. Okay. And he can build from there. Now in that mix, you're going to have your Shabbos table. Now, you're going to bring into the Shabbos table someone who believes, wants to promote, is interest, interested in Judaism, interested in what God has to say for the non-Jews, but he still believes in Jesus. So now you have your, your table with three Jews that don't know anything about Judaism, and you got a fourth guy over there who's very knowledgeable in Scripture, and more so than any of those three Jews, and he is talking about Scripture, and he's throwing in about Jesus and all this kind of stuff. And the, and the rabbi, what's he, what's he going to do now? If he's not properly oriented and trained, he sees this non-Jew as a threat. And the non-Jew is a threat because he's, now he's going to distract these Jews. He could get, God forbid, one of these Jews now is going to say, oh, that sounds very interesting. Go out, follow that guest at the table. You're going to have a congregational service and people are going to be, it's, he's going to have, like he said to me, he's going to have three Jews at the service. And he's going to have 16 non-Jews, all with different clamoring ideas. And some of them are going to be very vocal. If you have a person that's that's a, uh, you know, it's interesting. If you have a minister of a, a, a Christian minister, and he's coming as, to, as kind of a his, what he's considering a cross cultural experience, he's coming to respect the Jewish people. He wants to learn about what what do the Jewish people have to say. So he's going to come to a synagogue and he's going to observe quietly and he's going to respectfully. 
fine. You have a person who comes in who's a independent thinker. He's all worked up and he's finding the truth and he's left his church and now he's coming to the synagogue and he's going to be, has all these things firing off in all directions and he's got all kinds of questions and what about this and what about that? And he's quoting things and he doesn't even know what he's quoting and he's quoting, still has leftover concepts from the New Testament and he doesn't know what to say and, not, and, he's, and he's just bringing all this stuff up and he's could be well-meaning. But he's, everything is in all kinds of directions. So what does this rabbi do? His, his defense mechanism, so to speak, is to say, he doesn't have time for these people. So even a person who is intending on converting could be rejected from coming in because he doesn't have the headspace to clarify who's who and what's what. So he's only he's gonna only focus on the Jewish people. So that's his that's his that's what his take is. And he has the advantage of compared to a larger congregation, is he's one rabbi with three congregants, three Jewish congregants, he can be at the table and he could kind of interact with people and 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 refute the falsehoods that are brought up at the table. But imagine you have a rabbi of 200 families. That are all struggling to stay in, in 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 their faith and struggling to stay connected to God Almighty and keep their families together and keep put food on the table and so forth. And you're going to bring in 300 non-Jews that are all over the map and what they believe, and he can't supervise these interactions. He can't be at every Shabbos table. He doesn't know what stuff's going on. All of a sudden, he's opening the door and all these messianics are coming in and all these Christian evangelicals and confused people and people who believe in this, all kinds of stuff. What's he doing? He's endangering his own people. So I can understand where they're coming from. Their doors should be open. According to Torah law, they should be open. But at the same time, they're reacting reactively because they are not understanding the breadth of this responsibility towards the non-Jews. And the way to really protect the Jews is to have the non-Jews understand that there's nothing besides God Almighty. And the Jews will be tremendously influenced by seeing this influence on the non-Jews. You'll have the non-Jews return to their, so you have the Jews return to their roots much faster if they see what Judaism has to uh, influence the entire world with. So... What's the answer? The answer is, I believe, what we're doing over here is that you have to come at the outset and say, "We, I, I the reason I don't have this challenge because I don't in when we have congregational prayer, I don't have a problem. Anyone could come in because the whole conversation is about that. There's nothing besides God Almighty, and if someone gets up and wants to talk about so and so is the the Messiah, and so it's like, well, you want to talk about that? Let's bring out this, the, what the Ramam has to say on, and I've had this in classes, people say, what about uh, the people that Christians think is a Messiah? And I say, oh, well, let's learn the Rambam, show them the qualifications of Mashiach. I don't have to talk about what, and they all know automatically that, that, that Jesus didn't make these qualifications. The conversation never come up, comes up again. They understand that they're off, that they've been misled. So, and and I make sure when, you know, I have uh, WhatsApp groups and stuff like that, and people post stuff from Christian sources, I say, no, this is not acceptable. We're here to talk about the knowledge of God Almighty, and this is not part of what we allow, because you're teaching, this is a falsehood. Can't You can't bring a falsehood into a place of truth. So, but I'm developing it from the core, the way it's supposed to be, which is that this is for every human being. The Jews and the non jews So therefore, I'm oriented towards addressing exactly what is on their mind and all the confusions in their head. 